Okay, well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for tonight's presentation, Inside Plastic Surgery with Dr. Sumita Saha, Washington College class of 2000. After Dr. Saha's initial presentation, we'll have some time for questions. Dr. Saha graduated summa cum laude from Washington College with a BS in biology and minors in both chemistry and psychology. So we've got um, most of the sciences checked off there. <laughs> Went on to earn her MD from Georgetown University and completed her plastic surgery residency at the Ohio State University Medical Center. She's currently a plastic and reconstructive surgeon at Oaklawn, Med Oaklawn Medical Group in Marshall, Michigan. Hey, Prior to joining Oaklawn in 2012, she was employed as a plastic surgeon at St. Cloud Regional Medical Center in St. Cloud, Florida. Dr. Saha, thank you for joining us. I'll turn things over to you. Thank you. Um, here we go. Oh. Hi, I'm Dr. Saha. Can you guys see me again? My, my computer is really malfunctioning today, so. <laughs> um, uh, I'm super happy to meet all of you and to kind of reconnect with Washington College again. It's been a long time. I graduated in 2000, like Phil said. And, um, and as I was telling him, I was thinking about how old some of you were uh, at that time. And then I realized some of you, most of you probably weren't even born then. So that was a little depressing, <laughs> but that's okay. Um, I'm not that old. I'm 41, although I'll be 42 next next week. <laughs> but um, I actually met with two of you uh, late last year, Samantha and Mackenzie. I was very impressed with them. They certainly know a lot more about being a doctor than I did when I was at WAC. So, um, uh, but so that was very that was nice to meet with them. And the, the college campus looks beautiful. <laughs> um, there are a lot of there are a lot of updates since I was there, so that's nice. Um, uh, I actually took two gap years after college for multiple reasons. The, the main reason was uh, I had to be sure that uh, I wanted to be a physician. It's such a huge commitment, and it isn't really a it wasn't really in style to take gap years back then. So. So, uh, so, but I had, again, multiple reasons for it. I was actually a lab tech at Johns Hopkins for two years and it took me, you know, two months to know that I was gonna be bored out of my mind there. <laughs> so, so I did start, that's when I started studying for my MCAT finally. And then yes, I attended Georgetown and I matched into plastic surgery after that. And uh, yes, my first job was at St. Cloud, however, uh, that did not last very long. I was only there for eight months, and it was really um, like a paid vacation, which is which was great after residency, actually. <laughs> so um, I am actually now in Marshall, Michigan, and uh, I've been here. I'm an employed physician. I'm employed by Oakland Hospital, and I've been here for ten years now. Um, and you know. Uh, we're supposed to be talking about plastic surgery, so that's where I'll go next. But I'll be happy to talk um, to you more about my college years and, you know, the MCAT and um, applying to colleges or whatever uh, later. But I do, I do have a presentation, um, so let's see if we can get it to work. So. Okay, and share. Okay, it looks like it's working. I'm screen sharing. Success. Yes. Okay, if we can get it to load. And if we can't get it to load, got it to load a second ago. So, yes, yeah, start from the beginning, please. There we go. Is it working? Yes, it appears to be working. Okay, so let me start by saying plastic surgery is the best medical specialty there is. Uh, <laughs> if you're going to be a doctor, then this is what you should be. Um, <laughs> I, uh, you know, I do surgeries, I have clinic, I cure skin and breast cancers. Uh, I make beautiful people beautiful. Uh, it's, you know, it's the best. Now, you know, other physicians may not agree with me, um, but that's because, you know, they're biased too. 
but uh, it is truly a privilege to do what I do every day. You know, I get to do amazing work. I get to do mind boggling things like, you know, let me cut people, which is amazing. <laughs> and this feeling that I have every day when I go to work, this feeling is, you know, that, that I get to do all these cool things. That's what makes all the hard work that it took to get here totally worth it. And not only worth it, it almost feels like it was no big deal most days. Um, and, you know, and I wish the same feeling for each of you, um, you know, whether or not you go into healthcare, although I do think it's more likely to happen uh, if you go into healthcare, because again, healthcare workers are, we're, we're trusted to do, to, to do these things to people <laughs> that other people in other professions aren't allowed to do. So anyway, plastic surgery is about moving tissues around, okay? So um, it's different from general surgery. A lot of people say, you know, how is, how is that different? Um, in general surgery, you take out the gallbladder, you take out the appendix, and you put all the layers of the abdomen back uh, together the way they were originally. Um, in, in plastic surgery, we actually move tissues from where they were originally to new places. So the Greek word plastikos, um, that's where plastic surgery comes from. Uh, that, that word means to mold. Um, and it's not quite sculpting like a sculptor might do because our medium is actually alive. So we have to keep it alive. We can't, uh, we have to maintain the blood supply. So if we cut the blood supply, um, the tissue dies and that doesn't do anyone any good. So there's this balance of moving tissues versus um, keeping that blood supply attached. And so I always knew that I wanted to do surgery. I didn't want to just sit in clinic all day and talk to patients all day. Um, but so third year of medical school is when you get to finally uh, rotate in the, or at least it was for me. I know things have changed a little bit these days, but that's when usually the, the big rotations occur when you get to decide um, what your specialty is going to be. And so um, I started with general surgery and I hated it. <laughs> and I was really worried and, 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 it, and it was really hard and I wanted a break. So I picked plastic surgery as one of my specialty rotations because I thought, okay, that will be easy. Um, and uh, I walked into my first plastic surgery and this is the surgery that I saw. So there was an old gentleman with an infected hip prosthesis. And when they took that prosthesis out, it left a giant cavity in his hip. And so the cavity just continuously filled with fluid and it would get infected and he would just constantly have infections in his hip. And so what they were doing is they were taking this muscle. Can you see my cursor? Hopefully you can see it. It's the vastus lateralis muscle which is right here, and it's fed by this artery, the descending branch of the lateral femoral um, circumflex artery. And they were picking up the muscle, keeping that blood supply attached, and they rolled it up and put it in a ball right into his hip, right into that cavity. And so it's literally moving tissues around. Um, the purpose of that was to bring blood supply into that wound. So. Um, when you have blood supply and tissue in a wound, when you take antibiotics, it can actually get in there, you know. Um, for example, if you take antibiotics by mouth, it goes into your veins, or even if you get an IV, it's in your veins, and it goes everywhere where there is blood supply. If there's no blood supply, the bacteria just sit in that fluid cavity, and they just keep multiplying and multiplying. So this actually finally cured this man of of that infection that he couldn't get rid of. And when I saw this, it certainly wasn't what I expected because I was expecting cosmetic surgery of some kind. Um, but I also felt like a light bulb kind of just went off above my head. <laughs> um, and I thought, you know, this challenge of moving tissues while maintaining blood supply uh, is, is, is what I want to do. This is, this is really neat. And so what does a real plastic surgeon do? So Wound care is a big part of what we do. We, when wounds don't heal, uh, we're the people that, that those wounds get sent to. I'm actually the medical director of our wound care center. 
here um, in Marshall. I do a lot of breast surgery. Um, cancer, removing the cancer, although more than that, uh, we do the reconstruction of the defect that's left behind with the cancer. Um, facial trauma, I used to do a lot of it, but not, not so much anymore. This is kind of a smaller hospital, so I don't do much of that. And then there's congenital defects. Again, that's something that usually fellowship trained people do. Um, and then there's cosmetic surgery. So here is, oh, let's go back to that. So for example, this is a lady that came to me from a dermatologist. He performed what's called a Mohs surgery on her where he removed all the cancer and she was just, you know, blown away, flabbergasted because she said it, it, was, it looked like a, the end of a pencil and this is what he did. <laughs> and sometimes that's what happens because um, he looks at the specimen microscopically and cancer tends to have little strands of, of almost like roots that spread um, microscopically. And so the, the final defect ended up being huge. And so she said, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna take skin from my butt and put it on my face? <laughs> and I said, no, that doesn't, that doesn't work very well because um, this, the skin on your butt's pretty pale and it's not gonna look very good. <laughs> People are gonna look, know that you've got a white patch on your face. So let's instead use skin that matches a little bit better. Let's in fact, just use your cheek skin because cheeks actually have quite a bit of extra skin and you can, you can pinch some of it shut. So all I did was rearrange her cheek. So I took some skin from over here and rotated it up and I just closed it up. And this is what it looked like a month later. And she was very happy. You can kind of tell from the front view that this cheek is not quite as full as that cheek. But other than that, and, and you know, it's still swollen and they're still, it's still gonna take some time to heal, but I think it turned out pretty well. Here's another guy, kind of the same thing. I tried to keep that scar along his hairline as much as possible um, and really just move the skin around in that area. There's another lady. This skin came from right here. You can, all, you can see the scar here, this skin came up to there. And so, and the difference between taking skin from somewhere else and moving the tissue around is again, you get a color match, um, the thickness of, the, and I can, you know, with a skin graft, you can only take that top layer of skin because when you take skin and you move it, when it's up in the air, there's no blood supply to it. It has to get blood supply from the wound to grow into. And so you can only take a thin layer of skin. With this, I'm actually keeping the blood supply attached. So I can take not only the skin, but the fat under it, and that therefore I can fill the hole, fill the divot a little bit so that she doesn't have a divot. And I have several more of these. And you know, you can, this, this one looks fantastic, but that's because it's two months out. <laughs> so the, the more time that goes out, the better it looks. This one is one month out. Um, I wonder if I can show you, but this skin right here is what I moved into there and I closed it all. This one, um, this is an ear wound that has exposed cartilage. So it's very important to cover that cartilage, it tends to get infected. And this skin, you know, where, where did that come from? It actually came from the, the back of behind his ear and I actually tunneled it through. I actually made a little hole in the cartilage, tunneled it through and closed everything up. He doesn't have a hole in his ear because I, when I tunneled, I cut the skin, but I left the blood supply attached. So that's why there's no hole. Uh, here's a different kind of ear wound where the edge is missing. And so what I did is I kind of released cut here and I cut here and I just kind of pulled it together and it's cupped a little bit more than the other side. You can see that it kind of sticks out a little bit more, but it looks, it looks like an ear. <laughs> um, and he was very happy with that. Here's a giant forehead wound. I got that closed up. His eyebrows a little higher than the other, but otherwise I think it's pretty good. Here's a nose wound. Nose, so so cheeks are actually pretty easy. Ears and noses are a lot harder because there's no extra skin to work with. 
Um, so here you can kind of see the scars along the top of her nose um, where I moved the skin around. There's always, there's no skin at the tip of your nose, but usually up here at the bridge, you can kind of squeeze some of it together. So I just borrowed it from up there. Here's another nose. Oh, this one, this is a very unfortunate, oh, where did he go? This is an unfortunate gentleman who, the previous wounds have all been only partway through the skin. This one is all the way through. So this is actually the middle of his nose that we're looking at here. The entire part, the entire alar base here and the alar rim is gone. And so I actually had to reconstruct all three layers of the nose. There's mucosa on the inside, the pink stuff, the cartilage, and then the skin. And so I had to take grafts from various places. I took a graft from his ear for the cartilage. This is called a forehead flap um, because I didn't have enough skin to make all of this. So it's based on the supertrochlear artery. So there's an artery that, that ran up his forehead here and I lifted up the skin on it and I brought it down like an elephant trunk and he stayed attached like that for three weeks. And then I cut it and I put this in and it's still pretty swollen in this picture, but he wouldn't come back for more pictures later. So, <laughs> so that's all I have. Um, and then I like I talked about facial fractures. This is one of my patients, but I don't really do this anymore. If you look carefully, there's a fracture line right here and plates and screws here and another one here with some plates and screws right there. Facial fractures, here's um, left lip and palate. Uh, I almost did a fellowship to do this. And then I, the, the problem, the reason I don't like cleft, I love doing cleft lips. I hate doing palates <laughs> because that's the inside of the mouth and I hate working inside the mouth. So I rethought that a little bit. Uh, this is one that I did actually, but this is not a full cleft lip. This is called what's called a microform cleft. It's just really just a skin defect here. And so I did fix that one. Um, and then I do a ton of breast surgery and I didn't put any breast photos because I wasn't sure who was going to be watching and um, didn't want to offend anyone. So I just did that. Um, but this is probably the, honestly, this is the most of what I do in, in practice here. Um, oh, you can't put female breasts on, but we can do male breasts. So this is a, a patient with gynecomastia a male um, who actually had just a breast on one side and didn't have it on the other. And so I made a tiny little incision right around that areola so that you can't see the scar. And I took that tissue out and actually didn't even really have to take a lot of skin out. He was so young that that skin just shrank back. So um, this is the upper lid surgery. It's called upper blepharoplasty. This I sometimes do in the office, not this one. This one is, this one actually, I think insurance covered. And so we did it in the operating room. Um, he couldn't even see uh, because he had so much skin. So, but this is, uh, this is, this is now tending a little bit more towards cosmetic surgery. And then here is um, a lower facelift and neck lift. So these are the before pictures. These are the after pictures. You can see how some a lot of that skin is taken away, and then also her eyes. We did her eyes too. So, um, and then and then again, cosmetically, breast cancers. I mean, breast surgery and breast cancer surgeries are probably the most the biggest things that I do. Um, so, in terms of a day in plastic surgery. Um, I have clinic days and I have surgery days. Those are, those are the most, um, that's pretty much the two different kinds of days I have. Um, clinic days, I can start whenever I want. Here, you know, I'm the only plastic surgeon at this office, so I'm the chief of plastic surgery. So I can do, <laughs> I can do what I want. Um, and um, consults, so I see consults a lot of the time, cosmetic consults, insurance consults, and then I do a lot of procedures in the office. Um, you know, remove skin cancers, remove uh, moles, remove keloids, um, scars that people don't like, uh, and then um, Botox and filler. We have a hair laser, um, 
although I don't really, I'm not involved with the hair laser because I don't have to be involved with that. Um, we have an MA that does that. Um, and then I actually even do some, like I'll do, the, like I said, the upper blepharoplasty. I do some bigger procedures in the office too. And then surgery, the surgery days are my favorite days because that's where the magic happens. When you, when you walk into a, um, an operating room, you will notice the sense of urgency. Everybody's just running <laughs> and there's this adrenaline too. Um, and everyone is working towards one goal, uh, which is taking care of that patient and getting the procedure done as fast as possible. We wanna minimize that time that they're under anesthesia. So you get the surge of adrenaline and it kind of carries you throughout the day and hours and hours go by and you don't even notice because you're so excited. Um, so surgery days usually start for me, I'm in the hospital at seven uh, because I have to mark the patient. There's a lot of marking in plastic surgery because um, we got to make sure that both sides are the same, and symmetrical. And uh, these days, usually anesthesia will do a block uh, before surgery, they do a nerve block in order to minimize opioid use. That really helps with that. And so, and then surgery starts at 7.30, uh, almost every day. Um, some cases are 30 minutes, some cases are four hours. The breast reductions and uh, mastopexies and breast cancer cases are usually four hours. Um, and then facelifts, which I I, honestly, I don't do very much of anymore. <laughs> those can be six hours. If we're doing lids with those, it can be eight hours. <laughs> so uh, surgeries can get very long. Um, everyone else in the operating room gets to take a break, except for the surgeon. <laughs> Surgeons don't take breaks. Now, for the six and eight hour cases, I, I have, you know, taken a 10 minute break and shoveled food in my mouth. Um, but, but usually, uh, usually, no, nope, you don't get to take any breaks. Um, and you know, the day is done when you're done. Sometimes it's a longer day. Um, usually it's my, my block time. You get block time in, in surgery is seven 30 to five. So that's what that's like. Uh, I think that's pretty much all I had plan to save for plastic surgery. So let me stop, let me stop sharing. That's all there is. And shall we, shall we open up for questions? Sure. Yeah. If anyone has a question, um, we're a relatively small group. If you want to just hop on the mic, I don't think there's a problem with that. Or if you want to um, submit it in chat, we can do it that way as well. Yeah, um, can everyone hear me? Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Sorry, I just got off work, so I'm walking off the shuttle right now. Um, but thank you so much for the presentation. It's actually really funny that you mentioned uh, you're in a gap, you did a gap year <laughs> for two years at Hopkins, because that's what I'm doing right now. Oh, um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, Are you alive? I wanted to. Yes, I am. I work um, in prostate cancer. And sorry, oh, prostate cancer, okay. Yes. Um, so my question for you, when I was looking at some of the photos, it looks like, especially with the ear wound, um, that you had a little bit of uh, creative liberty. <laughs> so I was wondering if in plastics, yes. if you do have that um, flexibility and like, I guess, creative liberty to kind of, um, I don't know, I guess just like non-conventional procedures kind of thing. Yes. Um, in plastic surgery, there are multiple ways uh, to do things. I mean, there are you know ways that are preferred maybe over other ways, um, but uh, there's definitely more liberty than in general surgery or probably actually in most other uh, specialties. Um, for example, uh, when I do a breast reduction, which is a very very common procedure. So in general surgery, when you do an appendectomy, there's pretty much only one way to do it. I mean, maybe laparoscopically versus open, but that's pretty much it. Um, 
and you always do it the same way and no matter who does it, you pretty much do it the same way. Um, it, things might change based on how big the appendix is or how infected it is, but otherwise it's the same. Um, in breast, in plastic surgery, when I do a breast reduction, I like to maintain the pedicle. So the pedicle is where the blood supply comes from. I like to have it um, in the upper medial pole, whereas um, traditionally breast reductions are done with the pedicle from the inferior pole, where it's the blood supply is coming from below. So I realized early on that we always try to preserve the blood supply because we don't want that nipple to die. Um, that would be the worst possible scenario. So we're preserving the tissue where the blood supply is coming from. So I thought, well, we always want to preserve upper medial pole, right? Cleavage, right? That's what it's all about. So, <laughs> so why would we want to have the blood supply come from below. And also there's actually a better blood supply coming from the superior medial pole. It's the internal thoracic artery. It comes right down by your sternum and that's actually a better blood supply. It's got a name. Whereas, you know, the inferior pole is just, you know, there's, there's some blood vessels there and they, they're not even named. So, so I always use the, the superior pole. Now that has been, you know, they, they're describing that in journals and whatnot. It's not like I came up with it, <laughs> but, but still the majority of plastic surgeons still do it the old fashioned way. And, um, and yes, like you said, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, there are a lot of different ways to do it. And there's probably mo more ways to do it in plastic surgery, more ways to do surgeries in, in this specialty than other specialties for sure which is probably why I like it so much. Good question. Thank you for your response. Hi, Hi. I'm Megan. Um, I wanted to ask you about how you wanted to know, like how you figured out you wanted to be a physician. Cause I know that's tricky. Yeah, so I'll tell you, but I'll also tell you that it was wrong. <laughs> So, um, yes, I, so let's go back to those gap years, right? So uh, there were multiple reasons why I took them. Again, I wasn't really sure that I wanted to be a physician. Um, I also, I also, I took advantage of those AP courses. So I did college in three years. So I was already kind of ahead and I didn't really have time to study for the MCAT because I was so busy trying to get all my classes done. Um, and all my majors and minors. <laughs> um, and then I was also an international student. So I was here as an international student. I had no way to pay for medical school. And, you know, I couldn't just fill out the FAFSA. So I had to figure out all of those things. Um, and, and like I said, you know, two months into my lab tech position at Hopkins, I realized that there was no more room for growth. Like, you know, I was just going to be killing rats for <laughs> every week for the rest of my life, unless, you know, and, and that just wasn't going to work for me. Um, and so I needed a challenge and I thought, all right, med school is challenging. That is not the way, not the right thing to do. <laughs> I, and I honestly couldn't think of any other thing to do. Um, I only, the only two careers that I was aware of in healthcare were nursing and, and uh, medicine, which, you know, is totally untrue. There are so many possible positions out there. If you come to the operating room with me, we have first assists, we have scrub techs, we have circulators, we have um, RNs, we have, you know, just people from people that work in so many different areas of healthcare. And, and for example, a first assist gets to operate all day long um, with different surgeons and doesn't have to see the patients later in clinic. So uh, that seems like a wonderful thing for somebody that loves to do surgery, which is really, I, I, I just wanna do surgery all the time. Um, but, you know, but they also have to take call and then, you know, as a plastic surgeon, I don't really have to take that much call. And I really like being the boss too. So there are ups and downs <laughs> to, to everything. And the best way to really decide which part, which, which field to go into 
is to go to an OR or go to a hospital and follow these people around. Um, that's that's my best advice for, for figuring it out. Because again, there's, there are so many other things. There are so many other ways to get into healthcare. You don't have to be a physician. Um, but if you have like more specific questions about like, you know, was I worried about the debt or was I worried about making it through or things like that? I, I'll be happy to answer those. But um, I think it's important to think about the lifestyle because it is a very demanding lifestyle, you know, being on call all the time. Um, that, that can be really demanding. It, it kind of takes over your life. Um, you know, you decide when you're going to have kids, how many kids you're going to have, <laughs> you know, all kinds of things like that are based on your career. Um, so, so it just, it does take a lot. Um, it's a big commitment. And, and then, and then the things that you think you want change as you go through life too. So it's, it's hard to, it's hard to, to really say ahead of time. Um, but I know that I didn't know anything. <laughs> I, so don't do it the way I did it. Um, but my best advice to you would be to go and actually find um, people out there. There's a hospital, right, in Chestertown, Kent and Queen Anne's Hospital. So I don't know if you have any contacts there, but if you can go there and hang out, not just with doctors, but maybe with some of the other health professionals, that would be great. I also have one more question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, what was your major here at WAC and what was your favorite course? Uh, my major was biology. Um, my favorite course was probably genetics with Dr. Ford. I like that a lot. <laughs> um, Dr. Ford what was, um, she's a little wacky, <laughs> um, but that, that's what I liked about her. Um, I took some other, uh, but of course, as you know, you can you can major in anything you want. In fact, um, that's a good way to stand out is to major in something like English or something like that, because um, that will help you to stand out. You still wanna take all your biology courses and stuff like that so that you're prepared. Um, my sister, who's also a physician, she majored in psych and, um, she did say that she had a little more trouble um, because she hadn't taken biochemistry and certain things like that, which is fine. Now she's a surgeon too, and she, you'll, you'll get through it, but it will be easier if you do all your biology courses. Thank you. Your science courses, yep. I'm gonna piggyback off of Megan's last question. I'm curious, okay. are there courses either that you took that you found were useful to your career that maybe surprised you or ones that looking back, maybe you, you know, were like, wow, I, maybe I should have taken a little bit more of, you know, something like that, but maybe it's business, something else. Oh, well, <laughs> um, I mean, I took all the science courses um, and I, I did great in, in my first two years of, of medical school. Um, because it's just the for me back then the first two years of medical school had no patient contact whatsoever. It was just really hard college. That's all it was, <laughs> and that's pretty much what the courses in medical school are. Um, they're they're just really hard college. So if you if you get if you get the basic science, they will teach you everything else. It's just it's a lot of rote memorization, unfortunately. Um, I mean, other than, you know, your, all your biology and your chemistry courses, I don't think there was really anything else that specifically helped me and anyway, they're going to teach it to all of you, teach it all to you again. Anyway, I don't know if they have anatomy courses that, that was a lot, I remember. Um, so they may not even have, uh, things that, you know, the courses that might help you, but. I know they didn't have anatomy when I was there. So. <laughs> we do now. We have anatomy. Oh, great! Yeah, and so oh, while, well, while I think prereqs. Most of our pre med uh -huh. students do end up taking them. Yeah. Good, good. That's awesome. Anatomy. I mean, it's great, especially if you want to be a surgeon. But if you don't, 
Um, it's good to, uh, well, you probably don't do. I remember the very first course at Georgetown, they took us all into the gross anatomy lab and there were bodies everywhere and, you know, formalin filled the air. <laughs> and um, we had we had actually several people just walk out that first week of school um, because they just said, I can't, I can't do this. And, 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 you know, that those are things to think about. I mean, if you don't think you can, you know, study a dead body and, and uh, learn anatomy, then you med school might not be for you. But that's great that you're, that you're, it's good. It's good to just good exposure to get some of those words into your head. <laughs> ask a little question about maybe your practice. It seems like maybe it's a smaller practice. Do you prefer yes. a smaller practice to a larger practice and like why? Yes. So um, I have a family. I have three boys. <laughs> um, they're um, ones in high school and then we have a two-year-old. So <laughs> there, there's a big spectrum and um, you know family is extremely important to me. Uh, it wasn't so when I started med school because I hadn't had any kids yet. Um, and I actually had my first child in residency and, you know, things just, when I said things change, <laughs> that's when things changed for me. You know, I had plans to do a microsurgery fellowship and uh, things like, you know, do a lot more uh, studying and schooling and and then I had my child and all I wanted to do was stay with my child and, and watch my child and be with my family. So, um, so my priorities changed uh, literally almost overnight uh, in that case. And, um, and so uh, we were looking for a small, a small town. So my husband, I actually met him at Washington College, um, and he, his family still lives in Chestertown. And so we were looking for a small town like Chestertown um, with, with a hospital. And this was, this turned out, you know, this just showed up on my radar when I was looking and, um, and we wanted, I wanted a place where I wasn't going to be on call uh, and being called into the hospital in the middle of the night a lot. Now, that also means that I make a lot less money than I could be making, okay, in a, in a big, and, you know, and, and it's important to be able to, to know what you want and know the kind of lifestyle you want and, um, and decide uh, where you'd rather be. But this, these are the, you know, with plastic surgery, I'm able to be flexible like that. Um, you can't always be flexible like that in every specialty. So, um, so I think it's important to know what you want and then, and then make sure that you create your practice the way you want it. <laughs> but yes, um, I, I actually, I don't go to clinic until 9 a.m. because I used to drop my kids off at school at 8.45. So, and I wanted to be with them in the morning before they went to school. So, <laughs> and then I, um, and then they got older and now they go to high school at seven. And I realized that if I go to work earlier, I don't get out any earlier. And I don't get any more work done. So I still go to clinic at <laughs> 9 a.m. So yeah, yeah, my pleasure. Okay, um, I have a couple more questions. Sure. Um, so I guess, the first one is uh, why Georgetown or like, how is it applying to different colleges for you? Okay, so, um, so, so I applied to two colleges, two, uh, two uh, medical schools, Hopkins and Georgetown. And back then um, I, had, I had just found out that my green card application was accepted. And so, you know, I was like, oh, I can pay for medical school now. <laughs> and so I applied um, to two uh, medical schools that were in the area where I was already working. I had a job at Hopkins. And so I was like, okay, Hopkins. And then, oh, okay, Georgetown. And I just randomly picked them because of their location. And of course, 
you only need to get into one place. I was waitlisted at Hopkins, but you know, I got in at Georgetown. That's how I ended up there. Again, probably not the best way to do things. Um, when, when I applied, when I decided, when I finally decided and finally committed to plastic surgery, because again, it was another huge, I knew it was going to be a lot more work than being any other specialty. And so I waited till the last possible minute to commit. <laughs> but when I committed, I was like, okay, we're all in and I'm going to, you know, go for it all the way. And so I applied to every single plastic surgery program in the country, every single one I could find. And I told my, my husband that to get to prepare to move because, <laughs> because, you know, you can't get into a really competitive specialty like that unless you're willing to make some sacrifices, unless you're willing to move. And that's my best. Um, and then I had backup plans. Um, but that's my best advice is to, is to cast a wide net, okay, and then have a backup plan, you know, so if medical school doesn't work out, I mean, if you're thinking about nursing school or PA school or something else, have a backup plan. Um, and you don't have to take it or, or the backup plan can be can be uh, another gap year or something like that, you know, um, but keep your options open. Don't limit yourself to two schools <laughs> like I did. Um, but Georgetown, it just, you know, the timing worked out. It was close. We didn't have to move. It worked out. Well, that's pretty much the only reason I went to Georgetown. Thanks. Um, my other question is, I'm assuming that in the past 10 years that you've been in practice that some things have possibly changed. Um, and so I'm wondering like what's changed in the scope of, um, of your practice and also maybe what do you anticipate will change by the time that we're actually in your position? Well, I mean, so in the field of plastic surgery, there's been a lot of advances. There's, you know, I mentioned microsurgery. Um, that was kind of starting out when I was uh, a resident and now it's just, it's like commonplace, although it's still only happening at big university hospitals. So if you want to be your own boss and have your own practice and, you know, in, in the middle of nowhere like me, <laughs> then microsurgery is not going to be your thing. Um, then, and, you know, there's fat grafting going on nowadays. We can take fat, um, we can liposuction fat, and we can inject it into other places. That used to not be possible because again, blood supply, remember if you remove the blood supply then how's the fat going to survive? Well, now we're, we're figuring out um, how to get some of it, some of it to survive, not all of it, but some of it to survive. Um, but yes, there have been lots of advances. Um, we're required to actually, so I'm, I'm certified by the American Board of Plastic Surgery and we, I'm still taking tests. <laughs> um, every year I have to take tests and show that I'm learning and show that I'm, um, you know, there's, it's called CME, continuing Medi medical education. So every year, I think we have to have 50 hours of CME. Um, and then we have to take tests to show that we now, you know, they've, they've, they've made those, the, the requirements really easy these days. Um, like, and, and they're very, I like the way they do it. Like they, they, you know, you take a, you answer a question and then immediately after you answer the question, they tell you the answer and they tell you the reasoning behind the answer. So it's not just a random test that just, and you don't know how you did and things like that. So they are listening to the physicians and, and, you know, taking our uh, input into how these things can be more more educational and more helpful for us. Um, in terms of the scope of my practice, when I first came here, you know, I came from residency from Ohio State where we saw everything under the sun. And so I was ready to do everything under the sun. Um, and I was doing, like I said, facial fractures and congenital stuff. Um, now, as I've gotten older and wiser, 
I, I try to refer those to the specialists and refer those back to the universities so I don't do fractures and congenital things anymore. I hope I answered your question. <laughs> Yeah, you definitely did. And I was going to say on the on the other side, then, um, how do you anticipate will change for us when we're? Um, oh, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> it's it's hard to know. Um, I, I think there will be a lot more fat grafting and maybe we won't need microsurgery anymore. Uh, things, you know, it's it's hard to know uh, which way things are going now. Um, People don't like implants anymore, breast implants. There's you know, a bunch of people that uh, believe in breast implant illness. They believe that the, that the implants are causing people to get sick. Um, I've been doing a lot less breast augmentations, a lot more lifts and things like that um, in order to try to rejuvenate. You know, but, but I don't know that things are gonna change a whole lot. Once you know how to do surgery, if you're a good surgeon, that skill is never going to go away and it's never going to not be useful. I mean, I know that in other specialties, they're using like Da Vinci robots a lot. You know, they used to do laparoscopic cases. Now they do robotic cases. Um, my colleagues, none of them learned how to do that in residency. So they actually learned at work, you know, a rep came out for the robot and taught them. And, um, and they learned very quickly because again, when you're a good surgeon, you're a good surgeon and you, you just, it's, it's not hard to, to learn things. Now, if you weren't a good surgeon to start with, you're gonna have some more trouble, <laughs> but, but that's what residency is for. That's, that's where you're supposed to pay attention and make sure that, that you're getting what, what you need to get. Um, and so most of my colleagues, because you know they're a little older like me too, they they learned right on the job. And yes, the first couple cases were really long, and I heard a lot of grumbling. And then you know when it took off, it just took off. And and now they do robotic cases faster than they did open cases because now they don't have to close those big incisions. So so um, things are going to change. You're probably going to learn more robotic you know, learn how to do things robotically and laparoscopically more than we did. Um, probably gonna use a little more technology. Now telemedicine is becoming a really big thing. Although as a surgeon, I still, you know, I, I can't, I can't remove your cancer over telemedicine. So, <laughs> so, so, you know, there, there are limitations to technology. There always will be. Um, and the surgeon, you know, the physician will still be needed, so. Okay. Does that answer your question a little bit? <laughs> okay. We have any any other questions? I know we're we're coming up to close to an hour, and we try to keep these within the hour. But um, does anyone have any more questions for Dr. Saha? And if not, um, and I guess I'll drop it in now. If it's a is it okay, Dr. Saha, if I share your email in the chat? Yes. That's okay. Right. If they if there's anything else they want to ask, then maybe they just didn't want to ask in, um, in front of the group or anything like that. It's always helpful if, if they can sure. reach out. Sure. I'm really happy to reconnect again and, and, and help you out with whatever whatever questions you have about anything. Thank you again for uh, inviting me to do this. This was fun. Oh, absolutely. Um, we, we just, and I don't, I, I firm, we've been really making an effort to connect our students with our alums in, in the health professions and certainly to make them aware of how many we have. I think people don't, don't realize, I mean, just physicians alone, um, but then certainly in nursing and every other health field um, mm -hmm. that they're just, you know, they're not really aware how many we have out there and doing different specialties in different parts of the country around the world. Um, yeah, I was just thinking Dr. Vavril might not even know that that I I finally did become a doctor because she was she was upset that I didn't <laughs> that I didn't apply um, when I was graduating. Um, 
So I was wondering if she even knows. Like she might not. So well, she knows. She should know now because okay. sent this around to the campus. Um, and I think if she didn't oh. know, she would have emailed me back in, in like this total shock that, <laughs> okay. that, you, that you had gone on to do it. In fact, I'm not sure. I um, when I started in this position, I inherited a, a nice long list from Dr. Vavilla of people who had, had gone through and, and gone on to become physicians. But then I supplemented it with some other data points and things that the other parts of campus had. So I think that you were on the initial, but I don't know, but um, I'm pretty sure she was aware. Cause again, if she hadn't, I probably would have heard back from her of um, being just, and especially if she wanted you to become one and she didn't think that you had, so. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. All right, um, well, thank you for joining us. If there's um, no more questions, we'll, we'll let you get to.